Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I want to say hello to everybody who is with us here on Zoom and hello to everyone who is joining in from Facebook Live. It is so exciting that we have such a large crowd logging in tonight. My name is Colleen Pollitt and I am a facilitator for the James Patterson Literacy Challenge at the University of Florida Literacy Institute and I just have a few logistics to share to get us started this evening. So if you, are, if you are logged in on Zoom with us, you'll notice a couple of features towards the bottom of your screen. The first is our closed captioning. We are excited to provide live captioning tonight. So you'll see a little icon with a CC, and if you click on that, that'll turn your closed captions on. In Zoom, you'll also see a chat box, so please feel free to use that to say hello, let us know where you're joining us from, um, you can also share some resources and ideas with each other and just chat throughout the webinar. Also in Zoom, if you have questions for our presenters, please put those into the Q and A box. Um, we have a wonderful behind the scenes team who will be monitoring those questions and we'll collect them all and put them together to answer as many as we can at the end of uh, the session tonight. Now, if you're joining us on Facebook Live, don't worry, we have a team standing by on Facebook as well. So if you have questions coming from Facebook Live, just go ahead and put those in the comments and our team will be sure to get them to us. Because there are so many of us this evening, we might not be able to get to everybody's questions, but we will keep track of them. And after the webinar ends, our team will put together a question and answer handout that we can share with you. The webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available after the webinar ends on our UFLY website. We're also going to, in order to facilitate sharing some resources, there will be some QR codes that will pop up throughout the webinar. So you might want to have your smartphone handy to be able to capture those codes and bookmark those resources. Finally, we are offering verification of your attendance tonight. So everybody who's attended, um, who's registered, will receive an email after the webinar ends with a link to a survey to complete. Um, and once you complete that survey, you'll get an email confirmation verifying that you joined us uh, tonight. So that is all for housekeeping. Again, thank you so much for joining us. I am so excited to introduce our wonderful director, Dr. Holly Lane, and she will get us started with tonight's webinar. Dr. Lane, take it away. Thank you, Colleen. It, welcome, it's wonderful um, that everyone has made it here to, um, tonight to enjoy this webinar with us. Um, as Colleen said, my name is Holly Lane, and I'm the director of the University of Florida Literacy Institute, or UFLY. UFLY is a part of the College of Education at the University of Florida, and we're really excited to bring you the first of this series of webinars on virtual teaching. Um, I'll be telling you a little bit about the other in the series as we go, but um, in this webinar, you're gonna get an introduction to teaching reading online. So this really is an introduction. We're assuming that there are gonna be a lot of people here who are very unfamiliar with teaching reading online and are very anxious about having to do it potentially um, for the first part of the school year or longer. Um, so just to give you a little bit of information um, about us before we get going, um, this is the sequence of webinars that you are probably um, familiar with. If you made it here tonight, you've probably seen this list, but this is the series that we will be um, going through over the next few weeks. And this one is our introduction to teaching reading online. So UFLY is um, concerned with both reader development and teacher development, where those two things intersect is where we consider you fly to live. So um, we are going to be telling you a lot of 
exciting things that we hope that you'll want to share on social media. And we just ask that you um, use the hashtag UFLY if you're doing that. We'd also like for you to use this as you are employing different virtual teaching methods and tools, because um, we think that it'll be wonderful to follow um, this audience as you get started on your virtual teaching journey and th that others can find what you're doing if you're sharing it through this hashtag. We are going to be sharing quite a bit of information about the Virtual Teaching Resource Hub. Um, we created the hub in response to the very pressing need that was created by school closures in the spring due to the pandemic. Um, we had already intended to create a teaching resource hub and we thought, oh, well, people might need some um, support for the two or three weeks that they're going to be virtual teach, doing virtual teaching. Little did we know it was going to extend as long as it did um, or as long as it might still. Um, so we developed this collection of tools to support um, reading instruction online but all of the materials on the hub can be used in the face-to-face -face classroom as well. So um, getting to know the resources on the hub can benefit you now, and it can be benefit you when we get back into the classroom. Um, my co-presenter for this webinar is Valentina Contess. Valentina is a University of Florida doctoral student, and she's one of the primary content developers for the virtual teaching hub. Um, we are continually developing and adding new materials and all of the resources on the hub are free to teachers, tutors, parents, anyone who can put them to use. And we would very much like to keep them that way. So um, I'm going to do a shameless plug here and ask you to consider supporting our efforts with a donation to UFLY. Um, and don't worry, I'll provide a link for you later in this webinar so that you can do just that. Um, it's important to note that the focus of these webinars is reading instruction in the elementary grades, especially beginning reading and intervention for struggling older readers. Um, although secondary teachers um, will likely find some useful information as well. The we this webinar is an introduction to the series, so you're going to get a taste of what's to come. Um, but our focus will be on providing you with just an introduction to online reading instruction and some of the many critical factors that you need to consider as you're planning and implementing, implementing remote teaching. So given um, the tremendous demand for the webinar series, as Colleen mentioned, we're simultaneously live streaming on Facebook and um, th that we are anxious to provide whatever we can in the way of um, answers to your questions as we go. But likely, given the size of the audience, um, it's likely that we will miss some of your questions and comments. So that given that this is an introductory session, we do encourage you to participate in all of the webinars in the series and watch the tutorial videos on the UFLY Virtual Teaching Resource Hub for a lot more information. Um, if you still have unanswered questions after all of that, then we invite you to join our UFLY Virtual Teaching support page on Facebook. So we have a group that we've developed specifically to support teachers in um, their work. So um, I'll be sharing that link as well later. We are excited to get started, so let's do just that. So um, to start out by thinking about what effective online instruction is, we think we need to talk about what effective instruction is first. So um, we think of in effective instruction in reading as instruction that is explicit and systematic. So we think of explicit instruction that's clear and direct, that we are sure that students are understanding as we go, that we invite a lot of acti active participation, and that we ensure um, students are set up for success. Um, we also want instruction to be systematic, which means it's logically sequenced, that um, we're building on students' prior knowledge, and we're proceeding in manage manageable steps. There are a lot of other features of effective instruction, but some of the other key ones we think for online instruction especially um, is that we include a lot of corrective feedback and a lot of behavior specific praise. 
So um, this is all true of, of all instruction, but particularly reading instruction and particularly reading instruction online. And we thought it would be helpful to know where we're starting from. Also, um, conceptually, it would be helpful to know where we are um, starting from as well. And so what you're going to be hearing tonight is going to be information that will help you um, develop students' proficiency in reading, and particularly leading to them being better comprehenders. And so it's, I think it's important for you to have at least a little bit of understanding of the simple view of reading. And the simple view of reading is um, depicted through a mathematical formula, which is interesting for a reading theory. Um, and in this theory, D refers to decoding, the LC refers to linguistic comprehension, and the RC refers to reading comprehension. And it's um, organized as a mathematical formula on purpose because the idea is that reading comprehension is the product of decoding and linguistic comprehension. And so what that means is that if decoding or linguistic comprehension is missing, you'll never have reading comprehension. It will also be missing. If either of those are weak, it means that reading comprehension will be weak. So we need to make sure that we're doing things to develop kids' decoding skills and kids' linguistic comprehension in order to develop their reading comprehension. So the, the methods and materials that we're gonna be talking about are gonna be focusing on both of these. Um, again, since we're working primarily with uh, um, younger students, our focus will be mostly on learning to read words, so the decoding end of this. So the goal for tonight is to get you to the point where you feel comfortable moving from the classroom, face-to-face -face classroom, to the online classroom. And this transition is a tricky one, and we hope that the tools that we're sharing tonight will help you with that. So one of the things to prepare for effective reading instruction online is to think about how you're going to do reading assessment online. Um, to know where you need to go with your kids and what you need to work on with them, you of course need to know where they are now. So you may have online um, assessments already planned by your school or by your district, um, in which case that's already set up for you. If not, there are simple ways for you to do whatever assessments you would normally do online. A lot of that is simply through um, scanning and presenting the same information and you're sitting there with a paper and pencil recording information like you would in the classroom. But it's an important consideration to think about um, upfront, how are you going to assess kids at the beginning of the year? How are you gonna do progress monitoring with your students and so on as you move through the year? You also need to think about how to plan for online instruction, which of course starts with that assessment and using your assessment data to decide um, what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. Um, you can also think about your um, the scope and sequence that you're using, whether it's from your state or your district um, or from the curriculum that you're using. If you don't have your own scope and sequence, we have um, a couple of options for you to follow. You also need to consider the time that it will take to accomplish what you're doing. Um, online instruction is tricky in that way. You need to think about how you're using your time very carefully. Um, the, just the amount of time that kids spend online can be a factor in their learning and you wanna use each moment that you have them online as um, carefully as you can. So one way to think about this is to think about the areas of focus that you, um, what kinds of skills are you needing to teach. So a first grade teacher may look at these areas of focus and then take an inventory of all of the different possible instructional activities that you might do. And with that, decide how you're going to organize your instruction. And then that's where the time really comes in to play. So let's say that you have um, four days a week that you're going to be able to meet with a particular group of students. And you need to decide how you're going to get in instruction in all of these different areas. And it may be unlikely that you can get um, instruction done in every area every day. So you might need to make some choices. And um, for this particular group, this teacher might decide that 
Um, they might just do writing activities two days a week and might just do phonemic awareness activities two days a week so that they'll have time to get in all of the other activities. So um, thinking ahead to how you're going to organize your time online is really important. You also want to think about the methods of online instruction, whether you're going to be working with a whole class of students, with a small group of students, or with one child one-on-one -on -one at a time. And chances are to be most effective, you're probably going to need to do some of all of these things. Um, I will say that I um, can't really tell you that I think most reading instruction online can be done whole group effectively. And so I hope that you're not put in the situation where that's a necessity, especially with young children. So if you're working in the primary grades, um, you're going to be much better off if you're able to schedule small group time. Half an hour, 20 minutes of small group is probably better for those kids than the two or three hours of whole group that it would take to reach every child. And in your thinking about your organization, you want to think about how the grouping is going to affect the methods of instruction. So um, the ways to think about instruction online are typically synchronous and asynchronous. So synchronous instruction refers to um, that active instruction that happens in real time, where you do have live interaction with your students, and this is usually supported by video conferencing tools. Um, asynchronous instruction can be done in a lot of different ways. Um, it's generally not, um, it does not include real-time interaction, and it can usually be delivered either through a learning management system or LMS or with other tools um, like recorded video that you put on YouTube, for example. Um, it's very likely that you'll do a combination of these, but that's a really important consideration in your planning as well. Which activities can be done asynchronously and which ones need to be done synchronously. So this is a, um, just a little snapshot of a whole class instruction. These happen to be college students, but you can see how um, online instruction would look with a large group of kids as well. Um, one of the things with um, that to consider with if you're using Zoom is that this is about as many students as you can fit on the screen at one time. So you can see 25 kids at once. If you have a class larger than that, it makes whole class instruction really challenging. Um, it also makes it challenging if you're going to share your screen because you don't have the capacity to monitor what your kids are doing in the same way that you would in a classroom where you can see all of your students. So that's one of the factors related to um, online instruction that can um, make whole class activities more challenging. Um, these are examples of small group instruction where you can see your students, all the students see their reactions and have a lot more interaction with them. And here's an example of one-on-one -on -one instruction where the tutor and the student are working very closely together and can see each other throughout. So um, in terms of what you're able to accomplish in each of these settings, you, it's just like in the regular classroom that you're gonna be able to accomplish a lot more in a smaller group or even one-on-one -on -one or in pairs than you would be able to accomplish in a whole class. And anything that in your regular classroom you couldn't do with the whole class at once, you're definitely not going to be able to do online um, with all your students at once. And some things that you could do with all of your students at once, you still may not be able to accomplish online. So you really need to think carefully and make some careful judicious decisions about what you're going to attempt. So when we're thinking about asynchronous instruction, um, you can have um, opportunities to record yourself teaching a lesson, explaining things, and have it so that your students will play that back. This is a YouTube video of a lesson, and the student has the materials in front of them that they can manipulate to follow along with the lesson. And this kind of approach can be really powerful, especially if you do have um, a parent overseeing it, even um, 
casually overseeing it. They don't necessarily have to be sitting right there for it, but it usually will involve some parent involvement to get the materials set up and to, and to help out. So parent communication is going to be an important factor here. Here's more instruction um, that's happening with this, in this case, a read aloud and some activi activities following the read aloud um, where the the book is being discussed and some of the things that are just some of the concepts in the book are addressed just like you would do in a read aloud um, in your classroom. But this example is one that's recorded that students can watch on their own time. There are a lot of um, uh, Google classrooms popping up with bitmojis and this method can combine synchronous and asynchronous instruction in some really creative and engaging ways. So these are just a few examples of um, some screens from virtual classrooms that teachers have set up. So there are a variety of platforms for online instruction. Um, some of them are more designed for synchronous instruction and some are more designed for asynchronous instruction. So um, Zoom and Google um, Meet and uh, Microsoft Teams are all examples of um, video conferencing platforms that can be used for synchronous instruction. And then Canvas, Schoology, and um, Google Classroom can be used for asynchronous instruction. There are also a lot of tools for, um, that can support online instruction in these different formats. So um, as I mentioned, um, we do a lot of work with PowerPoint. You can use Google Slides, um, Jamboard, um, Flip. Grid, Seesaw, Pear Deck, YouTube. There are a lot of different tools out there. These are just a few. There are, they're popping up all the time. Uh, tech companies are really responding to the growing need that we have for effective tools for online teaching. Um, the, the work that we do um, in the Virtual Teaching Hub really focuses on these two tools. Um, and we're just going to take you through a couple of these and um, focus in on some of the key features that are kind of important just to be able to use them at all in, in online instruction. So in Zoom, we have um, the annotate feature and the remote control feature. These both can be really useful for online instruction. Um, to, do, to use either of these, you need to first share your screen. And with your screen shared, you'll, you'll see the bar at the top and the annotate feature is the first one there. Um, if you click on the annotate feature, you get this little toolbar that allows you to do different kinds of um, drawing. You can type on the screen. You can do a variety of things with it. But in this instance, the teacher is using it to highlight the OI sound that they are working on. Um, and so they just use the pen feature to draw a line under it. In this example, the teacher is using it to um, highlight a particular word that the student was working on. And in this example, the um, teacher can model uh, writing with it or can turn it over to the student using the remote control feature, which I'll tell you about in a moment, and let the student write um, on their online virtual writing paper. So the other um, feature that I wanted to mention is the remote control feature. And um, although it may be a little bit uh, scary to turn your um, computer remote control over to your students, uh, for the most part, it's a really powerful um, tool to keep them engaged and interactive. So to do this, you would click on that remote control and um, then choose the person that you're going to give your um, control of your mouse to. And when you do that, that um, the person you're sharing with sees this um, prompt on their screen that they need to click to start the remote control um, of the shared screen. Now, just keep in mind that if you're sharing remote control of your screen with your student, you still have control too, and you can take away their control at any time. So if they um, start moving something or clicking something you don't want them to, um, you can uh, take away their remote control. 
And generally, if you're sharing your screen uh, with remote control, then you want to share just whatever app that you're working in that typically works better than sharing your whole screen. So some of the um, tools for online instruction um, can also work really well within PowerPoint. So we have um, on the virtual teaching hub, which we'll show you in a few minutes, um, we have a lot of different PowerPoints that you can download and use for instruction. And so just having PowerPoint open in editing mode is a really powerful way to use it for teaching um, in a virtual environment. So the, what you're seeing here is a, a lesson or a activity within a lesson where the left side where the, all of the um, slides are displayed is shrunken down. So the teacher still can see what's coming up, but the students can't read it. So they don't really know what's going on and it reduces the distraction, just um, making that smaller. And then you see these uh, white, boxes. These are just using the shape tool in PowerPoint to cover up words until you're ready to um, uncover them for the students to read. So you can just drag it down and show one at a time. This is also using the highlighting tool. So using the highlighting tool, um, you can emphasize whatever it is that you want them to focus on. So in this case, this is a lesson about the AI digraph. And so um, the AI in these words is highlighted and the tutor is just uncovering a little bit at a time. You can also include notes to yourself down in the click to add notes section at the bottom. And so if there's anything, if you wanted to put together a word chain for an activity, for example, and think of your words in advance, you could type them right in there and they would be ready for you when you got to that part of the lesson. Another tool that can be um, useful, and this is um, just with about anything, if you have a Mac, you can enlarge your cursor and make it much more visible for the students. And to do that, you go into your accessibility section in your system preferences and click display and then click cursor and then you can make your cursor larger or smaller. Um, so just to show you what this would look like, you can see the tiny little arrow here pointing to the R at the top of the screen there. Um, that's, how, that's the normal cursor size, what it looks like from the student's point of view. And this would be a medium large cursor size. So you can see how a little tip like that, a little tool like that can really make a difference in terms of keeping your students' um, attention where you want it to be. Um, here's another example of using the um, just a shape in PowerPoint to um, have some uh, visual isolation and using it like you would do with an index card in the classroom. Um, another thing that you can use for this, um, we, we use little uh, clip art pointers. You can have a finger pointer, you can have you know, funny little arrows and things like that, that are just clip art that you're using to do pointing rather than your cursor as well. So as you can see, this is not your grandmother's reading classroom in any um, way, shape or form. Um, instead, it, it's something quite different. In fact, it's really not even your classroom um, like you are used to. So teaching reading online can look very, very different. And um, there are a lot of materials that can be really useful for it. So I'm going to turn it over now to my co-presenter, Valentina, and she will take you through this next section about materials for online instruction. Valentina, take it away. Thanks, Dr. Lane. Um, good evening, everyone. As Dr. Lane mentioned, teaching reading online really requires us to think a little differently about how we deliver instruction to our students, um, including the materials we use. I'm excited to be able to share some tips based on my experience teaching reading virtually, as well as supporting other teachers with their virtual teaching um, throughout the summer. So the first thing I'm going to share with you is a picture of the portable cart I have been using um, for my virtual reading instruction. This is a cart I can move to put right behind my desk where my laptop is set up. 
As you can see, it just has the most uh, frequently used materials. I have found a tabletop whiteboard that works really nicely. And I have a marker there, of course. You see on the second layer, some different types of whiteboards, as well as magnetic letters that I use during my instruction and both letter cards and word cards that I frequently use. So now I wanna show you um, how this is a picture of my cart moved up by my computer right here behind me. Um, here I am just using the, the whiteboard placed on the cart um, as I'm writing the word cart um, with my students pretending to. Um, in this next picture, you see that I'm actually using a physical whiteboard um, close up to the screen. Um, this is just a, the line paper Dr. Lane shared earlier placed in a plastic sleeve. And this allows you to bring the image that you're, that you're writing uh, close to the, closer to the screen. And then in this picture, you see me work using both the magnetic letters and the whiteboard marker um, to help with word work um, during my instruction. Here are the student material kits. Um, these are just two examples of two different kits that um, I have sent home with fam for families to use at home. Um, on the left, you see that I was able to get plastic bins and this kit included magnetic letters, whiteboard, a checklist, marker, and a dice. Um, you see the same thing on the right. Um, the one on the right is a little bit more simple of a kit, um, which doesn't include ma magnetic letters, but still enough tools to be able to help the student engage with the instruction. And so it's important um, when you're deciding what materials you'll be using in your instruction to find out whether uh, families will be able to pick up these material kits from the school or if you have the ability to drop these off. Here you see a picture of the student material set up in their home learning environment. Of course, the student has their laptop ready to go, as well as their checklist on a clipboard and then their magnetic letters. In this next picture, you see the, st the same student um, engaging in the instruction with his whiteboard marker and eraser. And you see kind of in the back, um, their, their mom's leg um, peeking through. This was actually our first session. So the parent was nearby in case we had any difficulties with technology or in case I needed to just ask them any questions. Um, but throughout our sessions, um, that, that close proximity is no longer necessary because the students get so used to using the tools that you are using for your instruction. In this next picture, you see how he has learned how to gain control um, and he's using the mouse to manipulate things on the PowerPoint screen. And you also see his, his blue bin nearby. And here he is, um, you see that I'm on the screen and I've um, make, made sure that he can see me larger because I'm using my physical whiteboard on the cart. Um, so you see that that's a little bit bigger. Here is another student engaging in virtual reading instruction and also her adorable little sister um, who wanted to check out what we were doing. You see that this student also has a blue bin with materials in it, um, including some visuals of the alphabet and um, some physical books. And you can see that this is also one of our first sessions. So she's getting oriented to how she sees me small in the corner when I'm uh, sharing my screen. Here's an example of a small group of students. Um, I'm doing a, a spelling activity with them. And you actually see that the students are using different types of materials to engage in this. So you see that the, the student on the right does have a whiteboard, but the other two students are just using paper and pencil. And so if you are unable to deliver student material kits, um, this is you know, a, a fine alternative as well. Um, there's also, be, besides PowerPoint, which like Dr. Lane mentioned, most of our um, hub materials are intended to be used in PowerPoint. There's also a lot of different materials free that are um, wonderful, uh, available online to make your instruction even more engaging. There's things like digital dice that allow um, you or your students, if they have control, to roll 
digitally. And there's also this really wonderful resource called uh, Wheel of Names that allows you to edit whatever you want um, to include on the wheels. So you could use it um, as a student selection tool where you list all of the students in your small group on the wheel and then spin the wheel for, the stu for a student to get chosen to do something. Um, it could be a reinforcement activity or an academic activity, or you can also do it as a word reading game. So the same words that you would have students read on the screen, you could turn it into a fun um, word spinning game. There's also, I've shown you, um, of course, that you can use physical whiteboards um, in order to uh, provide instruction, but there's also a lot of digital whiteboard options. So Zoom does have the option to select whiteboard like you see here in the picture on the left. Um, that feature allows you to type into it, write, highlight, erase. Um, so it is really helpful if you are using Zoom as your platform. Also, you can have just simply a blank screen on PowerPoint, like the example on the right, um, and then use the annotate tools within Zoom to make boxes, type, or write. This is a Google extension called Canvas that allows you either to insert a new drawing, they're called them, and that allow you to write, like this example here that says write, or it also allows you to upload an image, like the little image I uploaded here was a picture of blocks with Oconum boxes from the hub. And then once that's inserted, it lets you write in it. Another great tool is a Jamboard, which allows you to um, make things like word sorts or letter sorts um, using this platform. Um, another really important part of being able to deliver uh, virtual reading instruction is having access to digital texts. Um, so we've just presented a few um, ideas of ways to have digital text. Uh, this first one up here on the screen is through reading A to Z. Um, and so if your school or district have a subscription, um, it allows you to select both leveled books or decodable books. And once you click on a book, it gives you some different types of options. Um, so you can either share the PDF version or project it on the screen like you would on a smart board. Another great uh, tool to know about is uh, Flyleaf Decodables currently have a free selection, which also allow you to select a book and um, display it digitally for your students. And again, they're free right now. Here are just two examples of using the PDF versions of decodable texts from your curriculum. So these are two different curricula um, that have PDF versions of their texts. And so you could screenshot those and then add them to your PowerPoint slides. So um, now that we've shared a little bit more about tools and materials for um, learning online, we're gonna give you a brief overview of our virtual teaching resource hub. Again, here is the link to get to that. This is just gonna be, uh, once again, a brief tour. We will provide a more detailed overview um, on at our upcoming webinar. So as we've mentioned before, uh, all of our resources that we have developed and are available on the hub are free and can be used with many different platforms and tools. But the ones that we have focused on based on our experience teaching and supporting other teachers are Zoom and PowerPoint. So once you click, once you get to that page, you'll see that the top of the page gives you a little bit of an overview of what the Virtual Teaching Resource Hub is, um, as well as a really, really helpful introduction video of Dr. Lane explaining um, the virtual teaching resource hub. And then on the right, you see that the, um, our page is divided into four main categories. Again, we're not gonna provide a detailed overview of this yet. Um, that will be our upcoming webinar, but we do wanna kind of share what each of these categories are. So the first category is um, tech tools and tips. And so um, one of our webinars coming up next week 
is all about the tools both on that part of our hub as well as additional things we have learned about. Another category is the ma managing attention and behavior category. We have found it that it's even more critical that we think about ways to manage um, students' attention, engagement, and behavior. Um, so we are gonna devote another entire webinar um, in our series about management tips for virtual teaching. And then um, another area on the hub is called lesson structure. So we are gonna take a little bit of a look into this category. So when you first get to the lesson structure category on the hub, you'll see uh, again a brief explanation up top and you'll notice that there are some sample videos, um, both a tutorial of how to use the templates as well as actual sample lessons. The first one listed there, the one-on-one -on -one sample lesson video is actually of Dr. Lane and I, where I go back and forth pretending she's a student and then an educator explaining things. So that's helpful. Um, it's a helpful way to orient uh, yourself about digital uh, teaching. And then the other two videos are of small group instruction um, virtually. Below that, you will, oh, one more thing, um, I forgot, almost forgot. There's also where you see um, scope and sequence click here. Um, there are many different scope and sequences that you may have access to based on your school and district, but if you do need a scope and sequence in order to plan your instruction, um, we do have a version that's um, our UFLY scope and sequence. So below the, the tutorial videos and the sample videos, you'll see that this section, the lesson structure section is divided into um, grade levels. So the top is kindergarten through second grade in the blue, and then in the orange, you have third through fifth grade. Again, um, it would take us a very long time to give you an overview of all of that tonight, but we are doing spotlights for both of those uh, K through two and three through fifth grade um, in the upcoming webinars. We do wanna show you how these pages are set up. So we're gonna take a closer look at the first grade page. So on this page, um, it's the three main things on here are a lesson template, a sample activity sequence that you could use, and then an actual sample lesson that you could use with your students. So the first, the lesson template. This template includes any possible activity that could be done with a first grade uh, group of students, but this is not intended to be used um, with all of the slides. So this is just to give you a visual of things, instructional activities that you could use with your groups of students, um, but the idea is that you would select the specific activities that you would want to um, provide for your students. Here you see the sample activity sequence. So it's divided into the different types of instructional activities and into five days. And it just provides kind of a sample of what your week or two weeks could look like um, selecting specific activities from the hub. And then at the bottom, you notice that all of the possible activities are listed out by category. And then you notice that one of the days is highlighted. In, in this one, day one, says C sample. And so we've taken this whole day one and all of these activities that we have provided here and actually created a PowerPoint that includes all of the slides that you would need to teach that day's lesson. So here you see um, the PowerPoint view of all the slides included for that lesson. And you see that um, we've used checklist um, and those opening slides for each activity in order to transition. And now I get to hand it over to Dr. Lane um, to give you a little bit uh, more information about our instructional activities category on the hub. Thank you everyone, have a good night. Thanks, Valentina. Um, and I'm just going to take you through a little bit of what our instructional activities are and how they're organized. Um, again, I do encourage you to come back for um, our 
next webinar with where we're going to take a little bit more detailed tour of the hub and show you a few more of the activities in more um, detail. So if you um, click on this section, you will see um, that at the beginning, you have another opportunity to download the scope and sequence. And you also will see that we have a link for a glossary of terms. So if you're not familiar with the terms that we're using um, in a lesson, you can always go back and check the glossary and it will have um, simple definitions for you ready. Then we have within this section, um, six different areas. And um, just to real quickly go through what each one is, we have activities related to phonemic awareness. And um, as you probably know, phonemic awareness is the um, capacity to manipulate the sounds in spoken language. And it's a really important foundational skill for students. Then we have a section on um, teaching phoneme grapheme correspondences. So these are the sounds of speech and how we connect them with the letters or letter combinations. The section on decoding and encoding helps kids um, develop the skills in reading and spelling words. And learning to read words and learning to spell words or learning to decode and to encode are reciprocal processes. That means if you get better at one, you're going to get better at the other as well. So teaching both of those um, together is a really um, helpful thing. And we have a lot of activities related to teaching decoding and encoding. We have a section on irregular and high frequency words. We know that when words are frequently used, kids need to have quicker access to them. So getting plenty of opportunity to practice reading those frequent words is important. And they also need to help in um, reading irregular words, but in particular, learning how to notice how um, decodable most irregular words really are. So we think of irregular words as really irregular, and they might have to be learned um, just by sight. And in reality, they don't. Most, most letters in most irregular words make exactly the sound that you would expect. And we have methods for teaching that and materials to do that as well. Um, for the connected text section, it's obviously important for kids to get practice reading in connected text. Um, but we don't write our own books or passages, but we do have a series, uh, a set of links to materials that you can access. So um, some of the materials that Valentina mentioned earlier, like um, Reading A to Z or Flyleaf, those are um, linked as well as some other sources for um, finding connected text on the internet. And then our last section is writing because um, writing and reading are very closely connected, um, in particular in the, in the early years when we might not otherwise think so. So learning to um, form letters and learning to spell words and learning to write um, sentences helps kids recognize letters and helps them decode words and helps them read sentences and connect a text. So there are some activities in writing as well. Um, we also have um, links to some other materials, such as this app that is a, a very powerful tool for kids to um, learn to decode. And for this activity, um, kids learn how to move the um, letters or you can move the letters for them. And this is our beginning um, reading word work mat. And um, this is a great activity to share either um, via your video um, conferencing platform, or kids can download it and use it asynchronously, um, or you can use it in your classroom as well. This is the beginning mat. This is the intermediate mat. So once you get into the um, point where you are um, able to um, teach multi-letter combinations, so digraphs and arc control vowels and vowel teens and diphthongs and so forth, um, and at that point, you can use the intermediate mat and spell some slightly more complex words. Um, I also want to share with you something that is um, not available yet. It's coming soon. And this is our virtual blending board. So the blending board is um, going to be released hopefully within the next week or so um, by around mid-August. And um, the blending board is set up so that you can um, create 
uh, words for kids by changing either the initial, medial, or final consonant. You can also add a silent E or a plural. Um, but the, the blending board is something we're super excited about. We will be announcing it when it's released on our Facebook page. So if you haven't already um, liked us on Facebook, you probably want to do that to, to get word about the um, blending board. We also have some other things that are um, some that are available now and some that are coming soon. Um, we have heart word cards. This is one of the tools that I mentioned that um, are available to help kids learn about reading irregular words, which part of the word sounds like we would expect it to, has a sound box, and the parts that are irregular, the parts that we need to learn by heart, are indicated with a heart. So we have PowerPoint slides with these words, and we also have printable cards that you can um, download. Um, there are a lot of other printables that will be up soon. Um, word lists uh, for different uh, graphemes that you're teaching, grapheme cards, roll and read games, all sorts of other activities that you'll be able to download, of course, for free. Um, there are also some readings available on um, the Virtual Teaching Hub. If you're interested in learning more about the research behind some of these tools, um, you can download those. It, those are kind of just helpful, very teacher-friendly language to explain some of the concepts that we um, focus on. There are also quite a few videos. We have um, sample lesson videos that we already mentioned. There is also a, a video about uh, how to pronounce blendable sounds, which is a really important part of beginning reading instruction. Then we have tutorial videos for how to use the hub. So you see on the bottom left, there is a tutorial video. And then um, the, the video on the bottom right is in our management tips section. Um, this is a lesson that Valentina is presenting to the rest of the UFY team to um, explain about a lesson that didn't go so well and what she did to manage the situation. And so I really highly encourage you to, um, to watch the videos that are available. So as I mentioned, this was a quick um, little teaser tour of the Virtual Teaching Resource Hub, but that is the focus of the next webinar that's going to be coming up. So I encourage you to come back and um, take a, a little bit deeper look into what's going on at the Virtual Teaching Resource Hub. I also want to encourage you just to um, visit our website. We have other resources that you might find useful. Um, in addition to the Virtual Teaching Hub, we have a Dyslexia Resource Hub and a Parent Resource Hub. And um, all of these have plenty of important information that you might find useful. This is the um, link to the UFLY web website and a QR code if you want to um, capture that. And I also want to share with you um, the link to the virtual teaching hub if you haven't found it yet and a QR code for you to capture that one as well to bookmark. Next, I want to encourage you to follow us on Facebook. Um, and this is where we will continue to announce when we're posting new things, new collections of materials on the virtual um, teaching resource hub. So um, please come back, come by and um, like us on Facebook. <laughs> Um, also, you may want to um, join the Virtual Teaching Resource Hub um, Teacher Support Group. Um, this is a place where you can also, you can ask questions and they might be answered by UFLY team members or they might be um, answered by other teachers who have figured out some of the things that you may be struggling with. We have um, seen some really great ideas shared, things that we hadn't thought of and so uh, we do encourage you to come and learn some of those things as well. And I also want to encourage you to follow us on Twitter. Um, we have a lot of um, resources that we tweet about as well. And um, again, if you are posting about any of this on any of your social media, use that hashtag. And I, as I promised, I wanted to give another plug to um, anyone who is interested in um, 
supporting our efforts to keep all of this for free, you can donate to the University of Florida Literacy Institute, and I encourage you to do so. So in um, closing, I wanna thank you all for joining us. And if you would like to receive verification of your attendance at this webinar, there is a link here and you can use the QR code as well to, um, to reach the survey. We would love for any of you to give us feedback, but if you do want um, verification of attendance, then it's important that you follow that link and fill out the survey. So I believe we have a few minutes left for um, questions. So I'm going to um, ask Colleen to come back and see if she has any questions from any of our audience members that she um, would like to share and we'll see what we can do to answer those. We do. We got a lot of questions, a lot of comments, but um, before we get to that, I want to say thank you to everybody for joining. We had about a thousand people in our Zoom and almost 5,000 people on Facebook Live. Um, that is a lot more traffic than we usually get to our hub um, and we might have broken it temporarily. <laughs> So um, if you're having trouble logging onto the hub, because there's probably about 6,000 of us trying to get on there at once, um, just be patient. We've got IT on it already, um, and it, it will be up and running as soon as possible. So congratulations <laughs> on bra breaking, breaking the internet tonight, Dr. Lane. <laughs> um, but we do have a couple questions. So a lot of our questions were about the resources. Um, so once you're able to access the hub, I would encourage you to um, look, through those, look through those materials because a lot of the resources that y'all have been asking for are available there. And again, just to clarify, the webinar is being recorded and that recording will be posted on our Facebook page and on our website. So you'll be able to, if you missed a, um, a slide or anything, all of that will be available for you. Um, so getting into some questions for you, we got a lot of technology specific questions. And so I know that our webinar on August 11th is going to take a deep dive into tech tools for virtual teaching. Um, so I would encourage everybody to log um, to register for that one. But any um, any quick tips for maybe like a tech newbie uh, who might be feeling a little bit overwhelmed with with everything we've shared to kind of give them a little confidence of, of what to get started with and how to kind of uh, go through this process. I'm sorry, Colleen, your your audio cut out and I'm Oh, I'm sorry. So any um, any quick tech tips for a tech newbie who might be feeling a little bit overwhelmed about all of these resources and kind of where to start? Uh, my main tip is to watch the tutorials, both our tutorials and just go to YouTube. Seriously, you can type in anything. How do I make my cursor bigger on a Mac? Type that into YouTube's search engine and you will find somebody who has made a video teaching you how to do that. There is seriously a, just a wealth of information available if you seek it out and don't be afraid to try. Very seldom will you actually break the internet. And so um, give it a try and um, you know, see, play around with it and you'll usually find out that most of these tools are easier than you thought they might have been. Um, also, come to the, that Facebook group. The people on there are incredibly patient and will help walk you through. There isn't, there isn't a question that is too simplistic for them. They will help you walk, walk through any kind of um, difficulty you may be having. So um, reach out. Um, we are happy to, to support you in that effort through the, um, the support group on Facebook. But honestly, I think the best um, source for the, the new techie is YouTube, finding, just searching on YouTube for a tutorial video. There you go. Dr. Um, Lee, next... sorry, Colleen, could I add go something ahead. too? Um, it is really helpful to try out all the tech um, tools before possibly the start of the school year if you're able to. And one-on-one, -on -one, if you have your own child or a friend's child that you can practice with, that was really helpful. So before I was able to do it with a small group, I had done it one-on-one, -on -one, which is a really helpful way to transition into doing it with a larger group. That's a great tip. 
Um, so our next question is about time. Um, what kind of recommendations can you give for the amount of time to spend on virtual instruction in a day and what uh, a typical schedule might look like? I'll let Valentina take that one. Um, so like Dr. Lane mentioned when she discussed both assessment and grouping, a lot of those decisions will, will be based on the assessment data that you're able to collect from your students, um, as well as how your school has decided to divide up the time if they are providing guidance with that. Um, one of the most helpful uh, things that I think Dr. Lane mentioned is trying to really think about what types of activities are appropriate to do with a larger group that will allow students to remain engaged um, and be able to interact because if the group is too large, they, they won't be able to do that. And also your monitoring of their learning and their behavior will be much harder in a larger group. And so as much as you can, using that data to really form um, similar ability groups where you're able to provide most of the direct reading instruction and intervention um, and groups uh, that have students with similar needs. Awesome, thank you. Um, so that kind of leads into the next question about assessment. And I know we could do an entire webinar series about assessment, um, but just some maybe quick recommendation about some of the most important reading skills that we want to make sure we're assessing um, and any tips for how to do that virtually. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we teach whole classes on that <laughs> in in uh, the university, so it's hard to sum up in, um, and actually we're probably over time already, um, but I would say getting kids to be able to do the things that we talked about at the beginning of the webinar on the simple view, so reading words, decoding words, and being able to do that accurately and automatically is one of the most critical things. And then at the same time, assessing um, and instructing them to develop their linguistic comprehension. So that includes things like um, their vocabulary, their understanding of syntax, their um, not background knowledge about the world around them. There are a lot of factors that go into your um, understanding of, the, of our language. So um, trying to determine if you're if a child's struggling which area it's in is it in the decoding area or in the linguistic com comprehension area or is it a combination of difficulties um, and that's really where we um, focus most of our assessment on is those areas thank you and we're getting a lot of messages in the chat right now with requests for an uh, assessment webinar so maybe that'll be our next uh, our next series here um, one final uh, housekeeping uh, before we get going. We mentioned the um, survey. Um, if you're having trouble accessing that link, the link will be posted on the UFLY Facebook page. So you're gonna be able to get the link to the survey um, on the UFLY Facebook page. And I think that is time. So I wanna say thank you so much to Dr. Lane and Valentina for all of the wonderful information you shared with us today. I know we have, a uh, several more questions that we didn't have time to get to this evening, but we will be addressing those in our follow-ups on Facebook. So make sure you um, like our Facebook um, page and join the Virtual Teaching Hub support group on Facebook um, to stay connected and, and get answers to all of those questions and connect with all of these wonderful educators that have joined us today um, so that we can all learn from each other and make this year awesome. So with that, thank you all so much. We did it. <laughs>